Uh, so welcome uh, to my studio. I'm over here in California, the San Francisco Bay Area. And I am just a little bit about myself. I've been working with the Finer Collective North America, which uh, the artist in that collective ever Windsor Newton brand and also our sister company Liquitex. So the C and the supply list, we had a Liquitex item as well. Um, I've been painting for about 22 years. One of the first paints I ever used was Windsor Newton. It was always on our class roster at art school. And uh, for, so if, if we think it's reasonable, we can choose a group of patients from the all hands cohort who have, uh, you know, some like more as, as extreme as we can get of the hand. Oh, what was that? It's sorry, it was hard to hear. I'm not sure if I caught that, um, but um, yeah, so I've been working with the Fine Art Collective now for about a year. Um, I love uh, uh, Windsor Noon products and I pre predominantly I've been oil painting mostly. I do color pencil and acrylic as well, but oil painting is like my favorite medium to kind of cover and go over. So I'm really excited for you to be here. Uh, I have a little bit of um, some paintings that uh, you can see in my studio. This one I'm just shipping off tomorrow. So I'm really excited. I want to show you it's a lot of the colors that we're using today actually all of them are in this painting as well the color system i'm going to go over is a primary color system so it's kind of the colors i always put out when i'm getting started with my oil painting i'll use probably around like a dozen painting or a dozen colors sometimes in my paintings um but uh predominantly i'm always putting down the those primary colors um oh i do want to show you I'm going to have you uh, follow. Uh, I'm going to just flip my camera real, real quick. Just give me a moment. I'm going to have you uh, follow us at, um, if you're not following Plaza underscore art already, follow us on Instagram there. But I'm here at the Fine Art Collective North America. We do a lot of demos with um, Windsor Newton and Liquitex products. You could follow my art journey at Ryan Martin Art. Um, I'm represented by Mark Wolf Contemporary in San Francisco, also Elizabeth Houston Gallery in New York City, if you've been there, right around from Katz's Deli. And then also I've uh, been showing recently at Modern Eating Gallery, which is where that painting's gonna end up, uh, I think later this week. Um, always uh, follow Windsor and Newton. They kind of showcase their new products there before I even get my hands on them. So that's a place to kind of get your latest updates with Windsor and Newton. The company has been around for almost 200 years. So they have a lot of, experience with um with color and uh the color system that they came out with that i'm sharing is the primary color system that's uh three different colors and in your uh kit you should have if you got your sample kit you'll have the windsor lemon and the permanent uh rose and then the full supply list where you could get um from Plaza Art, your Windsor Blue is the other primary color, and I'm gonna be using Titanium White too today. Uh, there's also liquid I'm gonna be using. I have, I am kind of obsessed with this medium. I'll embarrass myself and show you <laughs> how big of a bottle I usually get. I usually buy the giant one because I'm doing, you know, 20, 30 paintings a year. Sometimes they're kind of big. So I, need, I use a lot of it. Um, I'm just gonna have this little one for now. <laughs> and I'm using uh, for my solvent. Sansador, um, whenever you're using uh, your oil paints, that anything that has a solvent in it, make sure you're working in a good ventilated place. And then for um, when you're going to be hearing me cleaning my brush off camera, this is the only part that's probably off camera, but I could always show you too if you're curious. Um, I just have a my Sansador, my paint thinner in the um, in a, like a, a little metal container. If you're new to oil painting, you're going to want to make sure you have it and something metal because it is petroleum based it could kind of melt through plastic items uh what else was i going to show you oh yeah and then you have your um your canvas we worked on the our sister company liquitex put out this premium kind of canvas it's made from recycled materials we're now proudly a uh, b corp b corp corporation so we actually are going to work towards sustainability and we have um the, it's a really cool canvas because it's actually made from uh, recycled bottles. And on the packaging, it says like how many plastic bottles, which it was made out of, which is pretty cool. I'm going to be using our uh, Windsor Noon synthetic hog bristle brushes. I'll go over to the benefits of using synthetic versus nat natural. It just kind of is your preference. I prefer a softer bristle, so I tend to go with synthetic brushes. Uh, the synthetic bristles are uh, just uh, are usually a little bit more flexible. 
uh, I got a number, you're gonna get a number one in your sample kit. Um, and then I have a number six was the suggested size just to fill in bigger areas. If you don't have any uh, any of the, your sample or if you didn't get the full list, you could grab things from your studio to kind of um, to use today and follow along. This is also being recorded too, so hopefully it'll be posted later. You could follow along uh, later too, if you want. Uh, what else am I missing? Let's make sure I get everything. All right, so um, the first thing I wanted to show is what's so important about the primary colors. If you're new to painting, um, you you know, in I think it was like kindergarten or first grade, you learned like you learned red, yellow, and blue are your traditional primary colors. When you get older as an adult or as an art student, you realize that red and yellow can't really make every color. If you use um, kind of a warm red and a very uh, warm blue, you're gonna get, um, you're not gonna get a very good purple. <laughs> your purple is gonna be kind of dull down. So a true primary red is more of like a magenta and a true primary blue is more of like a, a phthalo, which is a little closer to like a, a blue green. Yellow is pretty much the same. It's usually like a cooler kind of yellow on this side, the true primary colors. Uh, basically, um, that's what we're trying to uh, replicate with this color system. Uh, so uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is just sketch out a quick little um, uh, color wheel. You see I have my pocket color wheel here. I suggest always have one of these uh, so you could see uh, complements very fast and easily. But I also like to try out any new colors I have. We have a six color system, uh, but I usually try to economize my uh, what paint tubes I'm buying when I'm buying them in bulk. So I uh, ended up going with a three color system. I'm just pinning out titanium white, which is a very opaque white. And that's gonna be what I'm tinting my colors with. Uh, if you have an extra piece of paper canvas, you can kind of follow along this part, but if not, just feel free to watch it too. And then I'm gonna put out our permanent rose. So permanent rose is kind of what uh, Windsor Newton's, uh, that's our branding name kind of, like permanent rose is what we're calling the color. Uh, but the pigment, which is found on the back of all your paint tubes, PV19 is the pigment for quinacridone magenta. So if we work like with a lot of oil paint across brands, you could always look at your pigment and that will tell you what color it is. So quinacridone magenta is a very pinkish, uh, rosy uh, kind of red. Our color is also transparent. You could tell if it's transparent by this little square, if it's empty or white, it's gonna show that little transparent part. Windsor blue red shade is the primary blue that we're using. The pigment PB15 is a phthalo. Now, quinacridone magenta and phthalo cyanide, the way we've uh, produced them is synthetic. So most synthetic colors are gonna have a little empty square because they're usually transparent. Your organic pigments are ones that are more found in nature. Those ones are gonna usually be more opaque. Like this is Windsor lemon. It, it's um, a Hansa pigment. So PB, PY3 is a... Um, let me just put this, this real quick, is your, um, is gonna be your uh, pigment color. So it's Windsor lemon, but it's really a uh, Hansa uh, yellow. So that's gonna be really bright and vibrant, kind of replaced cadmiums for a long time. Um, so, it, cause it's just so bright. It is not fully opaque though. It is actually semi-transparent. So there's a little line going through the empty X that are the empty square. That means that it's, um, semi-transparent. If it's half a black square, that means it's, um, and half white, that means it's semi-opaque. If it's fully black, that means it's completely opaque, which is our white. Another thing to keep in mind in your tubes, if you're interested in reading your tubes, is it says the vehicle. The vehicle is what your paint pigment is mixed with. So if you're new to oil painting, um, your pigment is mixed in what we call a binder or a vehicle, which makes it kind of flow and all hold together when it dries. Uh, it's usually linseed oil. Uh, sometimes there's a little sapphire oil in there. Sapphire oil is um, is gonna be a much more clear kind of oil. So it's gonna uh, it's usually gonna be in a lot of your whites. We don't use sapphire oil all the time because it um, 
it takes a long time to dry. So if you notice your whites take a long time to dry, it's probably because it has a lot of safflower oil. So in your cooler colors, you're gonna have a little bit of safflower oil, but usually it's always linseed oil, which is basically um, they're crushed uh, flax seeds. All right, let's make a quick color wheel and then we'll get started on um, painting our fish too. I just wanna highlight kind of what these colors look like. I'm gonna get a little of my solvent off camera. So this is my Sansador, I'm putting it on my brush so I can just melt the paint away a little bit. The magenta, you can see it's very pink. And I'm gonna hey, mix Ryan. in orange, yeah. Hey, Sarah, sorry. Um, someone was asking if you could take a minute to go over the different, like the brush shapes and sizes. If it doesn't work in now, maybe at an appropriate time, that would be, that would be okay, great. Okay, yeah, sorry. definitely. I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm gonna note that real quick, so I don't forget. I will get to uh, uh, definitely the shapes of the brushes and stuff when we uh, get to paint. So the yellow paint, um, or I'm gonna mix an orange real quick. The Hansa is very cool yellow. So it's gonna be closer to like a green, not green, but it's closer to there than it is to like the yellow orange. And then if you um, add a little bit of your magenta, I'm just adding a tiny bit because the magenta is gonna overpower the yellow a lot. You can see you get a really vibrant orange, which is exactly what we need for our um, goldfish. I can make, um, I'm gonna grab a little bit of the yellow and you can make like a tertiary color. This was my secondary color. Tertiary color would be like a yellow orange. So you could get a lot of um, range of colors just between these. You could get um, a red orange, uh, so you're going to get your oranges are going to be very vibrant with these two primary colors, the permanent rose and the Windsor lemon. I'm going to get my Windsor. Uh, I'm going to get the magenta first. It's a little bit of a weaker color. Phthalo is kind of a big pow color. So our Windsor blue is going to kind of take over our permanent rose. It's good to know these qualities too, so you don't waste a lot of your paint, you know, how to um, mix it. So you can see you could get a really good purple. This is the hardest color to usually always for me to mix with primary systems is the um, the purple. So I'm glad that Windsor Newton Chemist kind of figured out the best way uh, in the col our color prism to get the purple was through these. And then um, a green, I'm not gonna mix the ter tertiary secondaries for that. The green, The blue is still very cold. So it's not gonna dull down your green. So when you add a little blue, you get a really vibrant green. So you could get a, a good range of colors with just these three pigments. Let's see, I'm on time real quick. All right, cool. Let's start mapping out our painting and I'm gonna cover uh, the brushes shortly. So uh, now we know we could get a full range of color with just these three colors and our titanium white, of course, we're gonna be tinting these colors. Um, but if you're new to oil painting and you're like, you know, it's something that you're like, oh, there's costly because yeah, there's so much products that you kind of get the solvent and your medium and stuff. You could really get away with just buying, two, you know, your four tubes of paint, or if you got two at the sample order, just get the, um, the white and the, um, the Windsor blue red shade. And then you have a full range of color. Let's switch over to our painting. Uh, first thing I do when I'm painting is I grab a bunch of reference material. I'll usually um, surf the internet, grab a bunch of different uh, license-free images or pay for license uh, for images so I could use them. Uh, you always want to make sure you kind of change up the painting a little bit so you can see I kind of use a, a mixture of these fish. Uh, or you could also go and photograph, which is a lot more fun too. Sometimes it's going to uh, photograph uh, fish or whatever your subject is, if it's people or flowers. Uh, on my walk to my car, I always love capturing the flowers and succulents and stuff people grow in their gardens. Uh, so yeah, just kind of taking in the world around you, finding a good uh, reference image um, to work from. And then I'll start with my blank canvas. So it's kind of the first mark you're making as an artist is your uh, canvas size. Um, so you have your Liquitex uh, canvas. It has nice texture to it. So you, it'll hold kind of a lot of paint. There's a lot of surface area because there's all the, uh, the kind of the bumps from the canvas texture, uh, which makes it easier to blend with too, if you like doing blending techniques. I'm gonna show you uh, the way I get started on my fish. 
it might end up a little bit different than this, but this is kind of the goal is to kind of get a nice um, kind of impressionistic almost uh, painting of a fish. Uh, to get started, I'm gonna use my larger brush. I tend to go with, um, there's flat brushes, which I hope I have some around here. So flat brushes will kind of look like this. Um, and then you'll have your, um, your filbert brushes, which is the one I um, am showing you here because it's, uh, I like it because it's, it's round and it has a long bristle which um, could bend more easily. Uh, the hog uh, bristle brushes that are natural hair tend to be a little bit more uh, firm, which is great for learning oil painting because you want to be able to move the paint easily. Uh, but for the techniques I use, I like to blend. I need a really soft bristle. Uh, they make softer bristles than this. If you like them really soft, like I use a lot of Monarch brushes. Um, which is kind of the higher end Windsor Newton brush, but uh, the synthetic hog bristle brush is great because it's soft, but it'll still move the paint around a lot. It kind of just depends what you like. I suggest uh, buying like one brush of each kind of um, bristle and maybe even shape. We're using the round too because it'll hide corners when you paint. Some people like the flat chiseled look. If you like that, then you'll probably do better with like a flat brush. Trying to think what other brushes I could show. I'll probably show some more too along the way. Uh, but yeah, filberts are usually the ones I use a lot. Here's the difference between a bright and a filbert. A bright's going to have a shorter bristle, so it's going to feel more um, stiff because there's less bristle to kind of bend, if that makes sense. All right, I'm going to get a little bit of my solvent, and then I'm also going to mix it with medium. When you're oil painting, I met a lot of artists who've been oil painting for like decades and they never use mediums. And I was always shocked because it's kind of something we went over a lot in art school, but I realized only because I pressed my teachers, like, what's a medium? How do I use it? <laughs> you know, um, and uh, mediums are usually going to be an oil, uh, like a linseed oil that you can get. You want to get something kind of refined or at an art store. You don't want to get like one that hasn't been treated like at a hardware store or anything. Uh, so you want to get like an artist grade oil and then you'll mix it a little bit with your solvent and that creates a medium. Uh, to simplify it, uh, Windsor Noon has liquid original and liquid original is great because it's an alkyd, which means it's an alcohol and an acid that's um, treated the medium in a way that uh, it's gonna dry fast. It's basically gonna be like an alkyd, a resin almost really. Uh, and it's gonna dry, uh, it's gonna cut the drying time in half basically. So what would take my oil paint is about a week to dry they'll thoroughly be dry in three days. Sometimes they dry overnight. Like the painting I have kind of behind me, that one I've been doing thin layers and it pretty much dries overnight. So I'm gonna put a little bit of this liquid in a little glass jar. I usually just put on my palette, but my palette's inclined. So uh, it's gonna be sliding everywhere. It's kind of like a jelly form. Let me take this off so you can see. And there's different kinds of liquid. If you like doing impasto, there's uh, there's tubes of a, a thicker medium. I'll show you real quick, actually, like this. So if you like painting like Van Gogh, you could use this. It's just the same kind of medium, but it's very thick and chunky. And the um, they also have liquid fine detail, so it's less jelly-like. So if you're doing like eyelashes or something where you need it really thin and watery, you could use this or the liquid fine detail. The liquid original, I've gotten so used to this consistency. I use it in every painting. <laughs> so this is kind of my go-to. I just feel like it simplifies my process uh, really well. So if you see me kind of grabbing here, I'll tell you too when I'm grabbing the liquid. Let me see if I can back up. I want to get my whole uh, painting in the shot. I'll zoom out as needed too. All right, let me lay down my paint real quick. We got our Windsor Lemon. I'll be a good art student and keep my palette clean the way I set it up. I'm not always like this. <laughs> if you follow my Instagram, you'll be like, hey, how can he so messy on his, <laughs> he usually paints. Uh, if I'm doing a small painting though, I usually on the smaller palette, I'll usually be um, much more organized. Otherwise I have a giant palette and I make a, a big mess out of it. Titanium white. 
And this paint's gonna go a long way. If you haven't been using oil mediums, when you use the oil medium, it extends your paint a lot. Uh, so I'll dip my brush in a little bit of the, uh, the solvent. So my brush has the solvent on there. I'm gonna get a little bit of my liquid. I'm making a really thin wash basically. So I have a little liquid on my brush and I'm gonna create, I wanna just kind of get rid of the stark white. It's kind of, it's an underwater painting. I want it to kind of have, kind of be harmonious in a way when I get started. So I mixed a purple and how do I gray a purple? It's opposite, so it's gonna be yellow. I'm just going for a gray, any kind of neutral color. And then I'm gonna get rid of my white. You could hear me scrubbing. I'm really, you could get in with a bigger brush too. I just wanna use a brush I suggested because this is gonna be good later, but you can get a, a lot done with just one brush too. Scrubbing away the, the white. And then um, we're gonna kind of lift some color off. Let me make it a little darker. A little more pigment. So you can see I'm barely using any paint. I might've even put out too much paint for now, but a, a little bit was gonna go a long way because I thinned it out with my um, paint thinner and liquid. So I put a little more liquid in there. A lot of artists when they work in oil paint, or if you've heard of oil paint, something that's kind of intimidating is fat over lean, fat over lean. Like uh, if not, it's gonna crack, your paint is gonna fall apart, but um, it's, it's not as complicated once you get used to it. Fat over lean basically means a lean layer is when you put more solvent, more of your paint thinner in your paint. And when you use more oil, like more linseed oil in your paint as a medium, that's more fat. You just wanna make sure your more flexible layer is on top. So if you use more oil in your medium, that's going to keep it more flexible. So you always kind of want to do that. What I like though is liquid simplifies it. I just put a little bit of liquid in every layer. Liquid is going to retain more moisture than um, dried linseed oil when it dries. So I feel like it's been a lo lot more forgiving for me over the years. So that's why I kind of settled on liquid. I'm kind of much more of a free spirit or painter. So I needed something that's kind of a little more foolproof. <laughs> so I use liquid a lot. I'm gonna wipe away my fish. That's how I'm gonna sketch it in. You could use a Q-tip to kind of draw on your fish or I just rolled up, I'm rinsing my brush off camera, by the way, in my solvent. Remember you can't rinse your oil brush out in water or well, the water and oil won't mix. I'm gonna roll up a paper towel. I use these Viva paper towels because um, they just leave less lint. You could also use like a cotton, um, old cotton shirt or something's like the best. And then you can reuse it too. I'm gonna make a corner and then I'm gonna kind of draw on a fish. So I'm gonna sketch out where, and oh good, you could see this on camera. <laughs> I was like, this is gonna be really subtle, but I'm gonna um, draw like that Ryan, circle. Yeah. Can you repeat the color mixture for the background, please? Yeah, uh, I'll go over it real quick again. It's the uh, solvent, a little bit of liquid, and I just use, uh, how would I measure that? A milliliter of <laughs> blue, no. just I just tap my corner to create a purple in each of the magenta and blue, and then a little bit of the yellow to dull down. So it's basically my primary colors, no white yet. And if it's a little greenish or if it's a little more purple, that's totally fine. I'm just basically just trying to get rid of the stark white. So for now, I'm not really too worried about the color. I just want it neutral, grayed out. I'm gonna sketch in, well, I need room for the um, tail. So maybe I'll put him right here or her right here. My fish will be there. The head will come out. There's a tail. You could draw this in too lightly if, with your brush, but I'm gonna do that in a second. I just like doing this part because it's like, if I mess up, just paint over it real quick and then get started again. You kind of see my little fish are kind of coming through, right? Let me show you a little closer. Just a ghost of a fish, um, but that's just to place it. I actually am gonna place a little more to the front. Move it a little forward. And then I'm going to start sketching in uh, the darks of my fish. Let me see where I'm at real quick. All right, so let's paint in our darks. This won't take too long. I'm gonna get, I'm not using my solvent anymore. 
as much because I don't want, so I didn't put any solvent on my brush. I'm just gonna use my liquid now. There's enough solvent kind of on the canvas already. I'm gonna make an orange. I want a dark orange, so it's gonna be a lot of magenta. You can see yellow's very light, so I'm just gonna grab a little bit of the yellow. I'm going for almost, well, maybe more yellow. I'm going for a dark orangey color, something in there. I tend to not mix very realistic colors. I know this might look more realistic than a lot of people's goldfish, but I kind of am an easygoing painter. I like to paint after a long day at work. <laughs> Oil painting really lends itself to kind of not have to move fast. It's not going to dry on you. You're working with acrylic. You might have to work a bit faster if you want to blend and stuff. I'm just going to make it orange. All right, now I'm going to sketch in my painting. So I have a little bit of liquid in here and then a, a little bit of my magenta and ended up being a lot of yellow. That magenta ate up the yellow really fast. And now I could start drawing. Uh, if you like drawing with pencils first, uh, you could always do that too before you do your little wash. If not, um, I always suggest to students to just go with the brush. If you mess up, you could like, like if I didn't like that line, you just wipe it out, right? And then just kind of paint over it. Like it's pretty foolproof. I feel like oil painting. And I don't want people to ever like, I have, I teach a very academic way of teaching at one of the schools I teach at. But my personal process when I tutor and stuff, uh, private tuning is always just kind of go with, lean into what you're, you like and what you do. Like if you're much, if you paint a little bit more loose, then you should just kind of lean into it. Um, I feel like I do more work and I'm more driven and stuff with my painting when I just kind of do what I want. <laughs> so don't feel like uh, you're... Um, your painting has to look exactly like what you're gonna be seeing in a few minutes. So I kind of outlined the silhouette of the top of the goldfish, the dark area. And then I'm just gonna briefly draw in very lightly and barely skimming my brush on the canvas to get the fins in. You can tell I'm concentrating because my, <laughs> my talking's all choppy. All right, I'm gonna sketch in where the eye is. Let's sketch in the belly. I'm going really light because I don't want a lot of this orange everywhere. I'm just like, it's convenient. I have it on my brush. Let's just use that paint while I have it to draw it in. A lot of paintings about kind of economizing your time and your brush strokes and your methods to get a, your expression or your idea out right away. There's a, a, this does take a lot of drawing technique, but again, a lot of times the best paintings you get is when it's not like the photo. As you see, mine's a lot different than the photo already, um, but that's okay. I'm just lean into it. There's no going back now. I'm gonna go, I'm kind of looking at this shape here. There's like a dark shape. So I'm just, that's what I just painted in. You feel like painting more uh, flat and chiseled. You could just pull your big brush strokes in. I tend to blend a lot. Like, I don't know if you noticed, but I was naturally blending the soft, Kind of curve of a fill a filbert's going to do that for you. All right, so I blocked in pretty much the darks. Now what am I going to do? Uh, let's see. Just want to make sure I go in the order I had written down, so I stay on track with all of us. So the darks. After we get the darks in, um, we're going to move into creating some of these neutral colors. Like there's kind of greens and grays in there. Um, right now I use just kind of full uh, saturation. I didn't dull down. I didn't even use white. White tends to dull down colors a little bit. Um, and Windsor Noon colors are just really packed with pigment. So you get a lot more out of your paint when you're using your mediums uh, because it will, you're gonna get a lot of coverage even if you just grab a little paint like you saw me grab. Now I wanna dull down a color to kind of mark in where these darks are, they're pretty much more darks I'm painting in, but they're kind of neutralized. So I see them as gray, but if they're gray, are they more greenish gray, brownish gray, reddish gray, orangish? I'm seeing them as greenish gray. So I'm gonna make a green, blue and yellow, right? And then to dull down, I use a little bit of my magenta and I have a neutral gray now. Now I'm gonna add a little bit of white because this is very transparent. I'm gonna show you what it looks like when I paint it on. I'm gonna see a lot of texture from the canvas and I wanna start hiding that. So now I'm gonna start getting some of my white. So I get a little better coverage. Now that's really dark compared to what I see there. 
but I know I'm going to kind of be mixing oil paint together, more paint together with it. So I could even add a little white now, or when I get to yellow, I could always add that in later. So kind of thinking a step ahead. If you don't want to think a step ahead, just make it light now. Let's do that. There's a dark shape here. Now I'm just thinking shape. And when I'm painting, I try not to think of it as a goldfish anymore. I'm not thinking about like, oh, this is above the eye or below the eye. I'm just trying to replicate like a printer almost like I see information there, laying it down there. I see information there. I'm laying down a little bit there. And just trying to translate it as close to what I see there as I can. And whatever doesn't translate is what uh, gives it that little extra character. So now I have my darks in. Um, and then I'm going to get in. Uh, well, I'm actually going to work in a little of the darks I see in my um, fins now. So my fins are much more of a yellowy kind of color. It's almost like mediums now, I could say. So I'm going to grab some of my yellow for the orange. And I'm going to sketch it in. I'm looking at the shape, but also keeping in mind that, you know, this is a license-free image. Some, and it's nice that the artist gave us permission to use it, but at the same time, I'm gonna change it up a little. Maybe I'll make the tail a little bit bigger, more dramatic. There's a little bit of yellow and orange here. So I'll put that in. By the way, is there any questions? I could answer any right now too. I'm gonna put a little bit of orange I see here. Thanks, Ryan. Um, the only new question that has come up is asked about um, where the recording will be located. And I just want to remind everyone that um, all registered attendees will get an email tomorrow with a survey and a link to the video, as well as the coupon code. So if you missed anything, um, you'll get that tomorrow once the, the video is ready to be sent out. Oh, cool. So something I do that uh, a lot of people won't do right away is I need to see contrast. It helps me so much to see contrast. And what I mean is a lot of people will be like, well, don't put in any of this black or dark background or nothing until you're absolutely ready to do it. Because if not, if I'm painting a light here and actually snag some of the black, it could kind of ruin your painting, kind of drag into it. I feel like it's really hard to ruin a painting. You could always wipe it out and add more, wait for it to dry, correct it later. Um, but I like to see a, my darkest dark. So I kind of know if I need to make anything else darker. So what I'm going to do is grab a little bit of my liquid. Making a black, basically. The darkest color I have is this Windsor blue red shade. And then I need to add my quinacridone, which is our permanent rose. It's kind of thick paint, so I'm going to add a little more liquid. I'm trying not to add too much liquid because these are transparent colors. So I needed to go on really black. And that pretty much made me a black. Just to dull down a little, I'm going to put a dot of yellow, the, the tiniest little bit, because I don't want it to lighten my color. I want to make a black. Got my black in my brush, and I'm going to hold my breath so I won't be able to talk, and then just paint a little dot for the eye. I also had to like stop my heart so it wouldn't move at all. But um, so now I got the darkest dark in there. So now I see like I can make a lot of other things darker compared to it. So it, it's good to sometimes put in one little darker area. Sometimes I'll just paint a corner or a section of the background dark if there is nothing in the foreground light, just so I could see what kind of my darkest dark will look like. Let's push the dark some more. I'm gonna make my green again. A little bit of red to kind of dull it down. I grabbed orange because the orange has some red in it. Um, now I'm thinking about um, scales a little bit. So to do scales, I'm going to kind of push down. And I'm going to show you up close so you can see. Ooh, try not to get any solvent on me. The brush pretty much is the shape of a scale. So in this whole painting, I'm gonna be doing this a lot. I'm gonna be doing little impressionistic strokes, stippling or stamping. I feel like it's like stamping on um, 
let me wash my hand real quick. If you get solvent on you, just make sure you wash your hands with soap and water right away. Um, so that's why I'm going to keep that kind of little texture going throughout my painting. The eye is kind of wrapped around with like a little grayish. There's even like a little greenish gray on the eye. If I'm delicate enough, maybe I could get it. And feel free to like, you know, I have a small, tiny little detail Windsor Newton brush I could use to get all this in. But I'm trying to stay a little looser. Uh, if you get in with only your detail brush, sometimes it could kind of um, keep you from working up the whole painting as a whole. And it doesn't look as effortless as when you're kind of getting away with a bigger brush. All right, let's start adding some lights. We could always go back to dark. There are no rules. All right, let's get a little liquid. In. I'm gonna get a yellow going. So I put some of my white with my yellow. And I'm gonna hit where I see a lot of light happening. So uh, I do see like there's a lot of scales Let's, it's a little too powdery of a yellow, so I'm gonna get even more yellow. I'm gonna stamp in a two little, two, three little scales. Remember I was showing you how stamping. A few little scales here. And it's picking up whatever's underneath it, which is fine. It makes things more harmonious when it kind of muddies a tiny bit. There's kind of some yellow here. This fish is gonna be a lot greener than my last one, I think. My brush is dirty. I don't want to bring the gray up top. So I'm going to clean off my brush, grab more of my yellow, stamp in some of my lights again. I'm trying to get away with as little as possible when I'm doing this. Now I see I do want more dark. So I'm going back and forth. So I'm pretty much just going back and forth between my oranges, my dark oranges, and my light oranges. Let's start adding more contrast. So at the edge of the fish, there's kind of these dark orange colors, almost reddish. There's like some kind of gill here. I'll just pull that in. Now I just swiped in the gill and it looks, I like that brush joke, so I'll just leave it. It's kind of like, I don't know, they have little bumpy heads. So put a little bumpy head on them. I see some more dark here. So I'll just push a stroke or two down there. It's kind of coming to life, huh? There's no dark under this fin, but for me, I'm like, all this gets lost. I want to separate the front fin from the back fin. So I'm going to just add dark using my creative license to do what I want. It's fun. Pull some of the orange out where the joint meets this little fin that's dark. So put a little dot there, maybe sweep it across. So it feels like a fin. There's orange parts of the fin that come down, almost like a ribbing. So I'll draw those and I'm pretty much drawing now with my brush and I'm turning my brush sideways so it's thinner so I get like a line. Cool, we're done. This could be a done painting already, I feel like. The bottom reflective light, it's like reflecting, I don't know, I guess the ground was light or something. It's reflecting this really pretty, that's my favorite color in the whole painting, is that kind of turquoise orange or green, I'm sorry. I'm gonna grab my light yellow, my blue, and I need to pastel it up. So I'm gonna add a lot of white. Mine's more vibrant. I don't care, I love it. I love the color it's looking like. Sometimes you love the color more than you mix in what's on the photo and you just try it out. So it's gonna glow a lot. So I'm gonna paint in this reflective light under the face. Basically trying to make sure I have a light, kind of medium and dark everywhere on the fish. I missed a spot there. Uh, so I'm gonna go back in with my light yellow kind of and put that in. To blend, you could lightly go back and forth over it or you could tap. I feel like the fish has a lot of texture. So I'm gonna do a lot of tapping instead. Now I wanna block in the background. We could always go back to our fish in a little bit, but what's really pretty about this fish is that it's, uh, I was gonna say it's feathers. <laughs> it's uh, not its wings either. It's uh, fins are transparent. 
Uh, so I'm going to get a little bit of that painted in first, and then I'm going to go into the background. So I'm going to use a white with a little bit of like my grayish green. I just don't want to use stark white because stark white we want to save for like any little highlight or glimmer of uh, the sunlight or something really bright. We don't want to just uh, use it on the white on pure white on anything. Otherwise, it'll flatten the painting. So I'm going to add a little bit of like there's a little light up here. Now it feels weird painting light on light because you can't really see it, but it is going in. So I'm painting in a little bit of white that's been dulled down. I'll add a back fin here too. It feels like it needs an extra fin. That's like behind it. And then a little white here. All right now I got my fins kind of blocked in. Now I'm gonna go into the background. And to do that, I'm gonna use my big brush again. I wanna get it in as fast as I can. Put some more liquid down. We're gonna make a black, a bigger pile of black. I guess we can make it here where we have that blue. I'm grab you can see now I'm finally grabbing a lot more blue, a lot more paint. We're gonna go through it a little faster now to make my black. I'm gonna keep it on the bluer side than magenta because I want it to feel a little green. Um, the color I'm using here is, or it's kind of like a reddish orange. And what's the complement of reddish orange? A bluish green. So uh, whenever you're thinking of painting, it's kind of like, color is like a plate of food. So if you have like, I don't know, if you have um, uh, like a steak right here, or a big, I don't know, veggie sandwich, whatever you want to eat, you're going to want a side. So on the opposite side of your plate, you're going to crave something here. Uh, so if you have like your turkey mashed potatoes, you're going to be craving your green beans on this side. That's a triad. But if not a triad, then you could just go with complementary color scheme, the opposite. So red, orange, and yellow, green. So my red, orange fish is going to crave a bluish green. So I'm going to put that in the background. This is where I'm drawing again. I'm going to concentrate. I'm going to really define the silhouette of the fish. Now you could get away with a not so great, like you feel like your painting's not that great. As long as the silhouette is there, you can you can identify it as a fish if that's what you're going for. So you could take your time just kind of going around the silhouette. If you cut into your fish too much, have like a Q-tip on hand so you could like wipe it away or you could use a rolled up paper towel and wipe your paint away. I just don't, I always feel bad if everyone's, if anyone's ever uh, afraid of making a mistake. I'm like, don't worry, it's okay. <laughs> I work with kids sometimes and it's like their paintings, I think it's the confidence that they bring to their artwork. They just, they're so proud of them. That makes their artwork so good. They're not uh, inhibited in any way by mistakes or afraid of them at all. So I cut into the belly a little much. So I'm just gonna improvise. I like the idea of painting kind of like being in a band where the accidents are kind of just like you're a bandmate playing uh, something you didn't expect and then you have to kind of improvise and kind of like jazz music. You gotta get in the groove and just play along with whatever is handed to you. All right, we're gonna go in here. It's looking like a fish, right? Slowly. I got my silhouette. This is, I love just doing this part. Like I like just making strokes that look pretty and filling in. You can go in really fast if you like, if this is the boring part. To me, it's satisfying filling, filling in light space with dark spaces, with dark paint strokes. If you struggle with drawing, just make a paint stroke that looks good. That's what's cool about oil painting is it really tends to make things look effortless. Like, wow, they spent a long time blending it. And it's like, no, just painted one stroke and it kind of blended in. So when I'm painting in the background, I'm gonna keep that in mind that these are transparent. So I'm pushing down kind of hard and then kind of lifting up my brush to create kind of like a transparency. And this might take some, some more skill and stuff, but if you practice it enough, it's cool. You get a lot of, um, cool effects with being able to lift up your brush as you're painting. I'm gonna 
bring back in the dark silhouette. It's, it's going in very transparent. So I'm just gonna add more paint. Because remember we had the solvent and liquid in the background. So that kind of thins it out a little more. So I'm gonna add more blue, more magenta, the permanent rose. Paint it in, I want full black. Anyone's painting along with me. Um, also, if you post on Instagram or anything, or you could also direct message me, I know we're gonna do our little showcase after, but I'd love to see what you did. I don't know if I'll be able to catch every, what everyone did after. I'm gonna do rocks and stuff on the ground, but I need to paint this dark in cause I'm gonna show you some quick little tricks on how to get the impression of rocks. I probably have like 20 goldfish in my studio right now. I'm doing a paint project where I have like a year or two to do. It's for my next solo show. It's gonna be a bunch of different fish. My father was a aquarium hobbyist and my uncle was too and a couple of our family members. And we had like a fish tank in every room growing up. It was fun, but also at the same time, a lot of work, <laughs> a lot, a lot of work but this is like one of me connecting kind of to my childhood again, I guess it's just uh, always therapeutic thinking back of those fond memories of going to the fish store, picking one out, caring for it, taking care of it, seeing it through all its diseases or whatever else you got to take care of your little pet. I'm going to put a little transparency in this um, fin. You can see I'm lifting up white. So to get rid of the white, and instead of rinsing out my brush, I'm just rubbing it on the background. I'm like, the background will eat it up, clean my brush. A little transparency here, I'm lifting my brush up. Again, instead of wiping off my, my brush, I'm using just the, the white that I'm lifting up just on the ground. I'm trying to economize my time. And then, it, I don't know, it just adds, uh, a little more harmony to the painting because there's some oranges down here or some white getting mixed in. All right, I feel like I got a good background in. I'm gonna carve this belly in a tiny bit more. It's gonna stand back. Sometimes it's good to go get a drink of water, whatever, <laughs> come back and um, look at it with fresh eyes, which I can't do. So I'm just gonna blink a bunch of times, look away and look back at it and see what stands out. I feel like I wanna make this fin smaller. So I didn't get a pure black in the background. I'm gonna just grab like the pure permanent rose. There's a lot of blue in my canvas and I know when those two mix, it's gonna make like a black. So I'm going in kind of with more black in here. I do want it again on the bluer side because I want it to feel like it's underwater. I'm going for kind of that bluish green. Let me add a little yellow. All right, background's pretty much blocked in. Um. I feel like I just, the fish still for me is more in finish, but I feel like this is a good point to kind of refine it now. So I took a break from the fish and now more things are sticking out like, oh man, I really need to make that glow more, really need to add more red. So I'm gonna go back in and kind of fine tune it now. So what I'm really trying to capture is a light on top of the fish hitting the top and a light reflecting off the bottom. And everything in the middle needs to be like a dark or a medium. So I need this dark, I need this dark, I need it all light up there. I'm gonna start with my darks again. I also got two green here. I don't know why I didn't see that before, but I guess that works because then I could show you how I wipe something away. Two green, so let's wipe it out. I want it just isolated down there and that looks better already. So sometimes wiping away is a, a mark that you're adding. I'm gonna add more orange. I'm trying to get this section painted back in that I just wiped out a little bit. You all saw that? How come you didn't tell me? It was too big. That's okay. Just fix it. Now I'm thinking about highlights on the head. Now I need to be careful. Remember I told you like, oh no, don't paint in the dark. It's gonna grab the blue. That's okay. If I grab a little, it'll just add character. So I'm gonna add some white, my magenta, and my yellow, a little bit of the liquid in every brush stroke. So it dries a little bit more 
fast. I'm gonna just lay on, almost like frosting a cake now. Adding in some more color. I'm gonna zoom in a little closer now. Uh, now that you have an idea of how I work on my palette, if I do anything crazy in my palette, I'll show you. So I'm tapping that in. I wanna add more paint to the top of my fish. So it's kind of like, I don't know, this sounds a little weird, but it sounds you're just gonna kind of kiss your painting with the brush. So I have all this paint on here and I'm just gonna lay it on like a stamping, kissing it, the little tiny scales. Now I need a couple bright ones here. Like I want a few to really shimmer. So I'm gonna add some more of my dark in so I could put some more of the shimmery ones in. I might need new yellow. My yellow has been completely like tainted over here. I could paint fish all day, this is so fun. Maybe some more orange down here. So let's grab, I'm gonna put out clean yellow. I did a bad job being on camera. <laughs> I did a bad job keeping my yellow clean. I should have just been grabbing from the bottom of the pile the whole time, but I do want a lot of yellow. And I got to clean my brush really well. If you have a clean brush, this might be good to get your really lights in. Hey, I do have a cleanish brush, but um, I'll just clean this one out really well. Clean, clean, clean. If you hear me off camera, it's me cleaning my brush. A lot of yellow. There's a little liquid here, so I'm going to grab some of that. A dot of white, mix it in. Now, a lot of people use palette knives too. Like I have my palette knife. If I'm on camera, so it's faster to paint with my brush. A lot of plain air painters will paint with their brush because it's faster. Feel free to use your palette knife if you like to. When I have such small paintings, I tend to mix with my brush. Benefits of using a palette knife is you're just going to save your brush a little more because um, you're not banging up the bristles a lot. I just find it's much more convenient to paint faster and it mixed with my brush for small paintings. Big paintings like the one that I showed you kind of behind me are going to be uh, ones I definitely use a palette knife with. Again, I'm just kissing the yellow to the painting. I got the little glimmer on there. Ah, oh, that was fun. I hope you're able to do that. It's always fun when you kind of hit something right. You're like, yeah, that's what you paint for is just that one moment where you hit, hit it with a color or something and then it starts to sing. And that's when you have to take your break so you end on a good swing. <laughs> the eye doesn't look as refined, so I don't know what I'm gonna do. I might have to hit it with this yellow. There is no yellow in my eye, but I'm going to add yellow to kind of add a shimmer, maybe on the bottom too. No, the bottom should be kind of white. This is a lot of white. So I'll show you a closer view of what I did. So you can see it's clunky, but from far away, it's starting to read as the fish. There's a highlight on the fish tail. I'm gonna just drag my yellow in. It's too yellow, so just drag over it again. I'll kind of dull it down. Oil paint is notorious for that, to kind of blending out right away. I'm just gonna hit a few more places. I'm trying not to get too crazy with it, but it's too fun adding the little scales. I grab some blue, see what happened. I'm just gonna leave it. Nobody knows, could be reflecting something blue off camera. All right, I should calm down with the highlights. <laughs> uh, no, a few more, just up here. I promise this is it. I added too much, so I'm gonna go over them again, kind of tame them down. All right, now I got my little fish. Now I said I wanted to add a little highlight on the bottom part of the eye. So I'm going almost with pure white because I feel like the fish eye is one of the whitest parts and I'm gonna hit just the bottom of the eye with this white with a little, it has a little bit of green in there. So it's kind of shimmering underneath. Now, anywhere else it needs to be hit. Yeah, I feel like there should be a few scales down here that are hit with almost pure white. You could hear me holding my breath. 
Try not to get too crazy. All right. Now I'm going to start adding in the fishtail. So I'm going to grab some of my white. I'm almost, I'm pretty much going pure white now with a tiny dot of liquid. My background has liquid in it and some of the solvent from when I first rubbed it on. And then with the white, actually that's too white. See, I held it up. I'm like, no, it's, that's too much. I'm going to add a little bit of like green because it is going to melt into the background, but not that much. Let's try it out. I'm just going to be pooling where I see the fin, like the top of the fin. I'm trying to get a really thin line. So to do that, again, I'm turning my brush sideways. So it's like a pencil. I'm going to use it as or a pen and drag it through. That's a tall fin. I feel like my fin needs to go out more. Let's make it bigger. See, that was easy to do right away. And then I'm gonna do this back part. Okay, anyone have any questions too while I'm painting in the fins? I'm gonna be going into the background a little bit. We have a couple of exciting things coming up. I'm gonna be showing you how to glaze um, on the painting that I've completed as kind of a demo for this, this one. Look at how different they look. I don't know, which one do I like more? I love how this one's more detailed, but I love how that one's more loose. Um, I'll, I'll be glazing on that one, so it's gonna change a little bit. I'm pulling my brush. Now I'm not drawing, I'm kind of using the shape of the brush to kind of pull these round areas. And again, I'm, I'm changing the way it looks. It's, for me, painting is, um, is about changing things a little bit. I'm trying to show like a feeling along with a subject. <laughs> if I keep pausing with my talking, it's because I actually am holding my breath. See my hand shakes when I'm breathing. <laughs> I gotta like hold my breath so that my hand is more steady. Pulling it, I'm doing the same technique again. I'm pulling it and then lifting off. So I'm easing up on the brush as I get closer so that it feels more transparent. Let's put a stroker here. Cool, I got my fish, done. But let's do a background. Uh, I'm gonna spend about maybe a few minutes doing that. We'll have an extra time to glaze, that'll be cool. All right. Um, for the background, I am gonna kind of make it up. <laughs> I grew up with aquariums, so I kind of, have an idea of how, kind of how they look. I wanna do um, little rocks. So I'm gonna just get some white, a little bit of my magenta, a little bit of my blue, and a little bit of my yellow. So that's gonna basically just make a gray. I want it more of a brown, so I'm gonna to need to make something more brown. Brown's kind of a dull down orange. So that means I'm gonna be more heavy with the red, my rose, and more heavy with my yellow. That'll make me a brown. I'm gonna add a little liquid and mix it in because I want to make sure it's drying kind of fast. I don't have an oil painting sitting around too long. I'm going to add a little more white. And I'm going to paint like little pebbles. So I'm going to start in the foreground because this is where it's going to show up lightest. I'll just pull like a pebble there. So I just pulled a paint stroke. And then I'll pull one here, maybe a smaller one. And I'm going to work my way back. So they kind of just disappear into the distance. And then I'm gonna clean off my brush kind of a little bit on the side, grab some more color and then do it again. Maybe we'll do a bigger rock. I just push down, kind of just stamping again. And then go into the background with leftover paint, making the pebbles a little smaller in the background because things go further away, they recede. I don't know, maybe it's darker in the background so they don't show up as much. So that's how I'm painting in my little Pebbles, oops, I accidentally made a mark there, that's all right. So my paint's turning a little bluer, so that's okay, because I'm mixing the blue that I grabbed off here by accident in here, but I'm just gonna work my way outward. So it's kind of like it's losing color as it goes to the sides too, not only back. And now I have the impression of like a little, I don't know, it could even be a bottle of a pond, doesn't have to be an aquarium, which is cool. I wanna add more variety in my rocks, like if it is in a, a, a pond or something, so I'm gonna add more, I'm gonna make a pinker rock. Maybe I'll add one over here. 
I guess down here, there'll be like really big rocks. So I'm just gonna slap on thicker paint. I'll put a lot more white into this one. It's much more in the foreground. I've kind of just painted the top of the rock and then the bottom or something, the side. This is for people who love palette knife painting. You could always get some paint on your palette knife. Should I do it? Let's do it. Get some paint. And then you can kind of just smush it on, bake it on, frost it on. It always reminds me of frosting. I think I watched too much, too much cooking uh, TV. Let's grab some more paint. So your palette knife paint, if you wanted, if you have your palette knife laying around, you could also get a similar effect with just grabbing a lot of paint with your brush. If I'm gonna grab a lot of paint. Let's mix a little liquid in there. So it's gonna be kind of a thicker paint. And when things are kind of in the foreground, it helps if you make them chunkier, it looks like they're popping out more. So I got a lot of paint and I could just lay it on frosting a little bit. That's gonna make this foreground pop out a little more. So things that are opaque pop forward, things that are chunkier kind of pop forward, things that are thinner recede, things that are older and bluer recede. So I'm adding more reds kind of in the front. Um, so I'm just getting them, giving the impression of little rocks. So I'm gonna show you a little closer. We are almost time to, um, to do glazing. Um, first, let me get some grass and stuff in the background. Aquatic things, I love planted aquariums. It's my favorite thing to watch on Instagram is people planting aquariums. Like it's when they have a little fish aquarium. They don't even have fish sometimes. It's just plants, aquatic plants, plants I'm sorry. I'm going to show you some of my green. I'm making more of a pastel green because I know it's going to kind of melt in the background. This might be too bright. Let's see what happens. I'll start with a little grass. Whenever I used to see grass kind of growing, it kind of start in the bottom and pull up. Uh, this whole area is kind of empty, so it'd be cool to kind of testing out the shape I want. Do a nice flowy kind of piece of grass. So I have some variety in my painting now too. I got more of like a chunky kind of painted fish and in the background, there's kind of this nice flowy kind of green. It's not showing up in the background too much, but it's okay if somebody got close. Or I think you could see it on camera. There's these little kind of pieces of grass hanging out. Let's add really small pieces of grass in the foreground, I'm adding a lot of green. I didn't, I don't think I did this in the other one, but I feel like the painting is craving more green because there's a lot of like purples. Uh, if there's a lot of purple and a lot of green, it's kind of trying to pull in a triad. So it's craving, or, I mean, it has red, orange and green and violet. So that's going to be my triad. So it has a lot of violet and a lot of orange. So it's kind of craving green now. There are a lot of purple showing up down here where I add a lot of the magenta. So I'm going to pull in some of these greens. Let's do one maybe that's kind of more leafy, something different, add variety. Maybe it's growing all the way up top. This is fun too when you start leaving the photograph behind and just start making things up. Ooh, you could do like a starry background instead of a green one if you wanted. Something I like about water is that reflective light that's right at the top. So to do that, I'm gonna grab, again, my big brush, grab a lot of my blue, just trying to conserve what I have. I'm just gonna use a lot of my blue Lay it on kind of thick, going across the top. Then get my color. And this is where I'm going to get full pure white. Add a little bit of my liquid. 
your medium is going to extend your paint. It's going to make it more flowy. And then I'm just going to barely, I'm going to go very horizontal. I'm going to barely skim parts of my paint to add kind of like the shimmer. Maybe it's the top of the fin reflecting off the disturbed water on top. like the top of an aquarium or a little pond. I need one more. Let me get a big one in. You could add bubbles. You could add like a little shell on the bottom. I could keep painting into this for hours, but I know we're kind of more limited on time. Uh, so we got the rocks on the background in and some of the glimmer. Um, so I hope you had fun painting on this. Don't leave yet, though. We got a lot to cover still. I, I know it's just uh, only like 20 minutes or so, but glazing is my favorite part of painting. <laughs> so if this didn't look like it was my favorite part, um, I'm sorry. But yeah, I love painting. But at the same time, glazing is one of my favorites. It's because you got a painting that you really love and you're just kind of pushing it further. Uh, is there any questions at this point, what we did so far? Um, yeah. I'd love to answer. Yeah. If not, we're going to have Q&A a little later, too. Um, we do have one question here, Ryan. Um, somebody yeah. has asked about the uh, cover technique. So th this fits in with glazing um, about how you seal and finish your painting once they're done, like varnishing. And oh, how long do you wait to uh, for the paint to cure? Awesome. Oh, those are excellent questions because these are ones that were never answered to me in college. It was something I had to kind of look up on my, by myself. Or now that I'm with Windsor Newton, I'm really understanding the importance a lot more for making sure that your paint is thoroughly dry. Acrylic is so forgiving. It dries like while you're painting it, which might be a bad thing <laughs> if you like blending like me, but it dries so fast, you don't have to worry about it. Oil painting, before you seal it, it's recommended that you wait six months to a year. If you're painting really thick, you might have to wait even longer than a year. But, but for how most people paint, you might, might feel dry to the touch if you're painting kind of thin. You still want to wait at least six months. Uh, I'll show you this painting I painted, you know, a couple months ago. So I wouldn't go in and varnish the still, even though it's dry to the touch. You know, I touch it. I look at it really close, really dry to me. Um, but it really takes a long time for the oil molecules to grab an oxygen one and oxidize. Um, and just to be safe, the six months is kind of the window we wait a year if you're painting thick. But for this one, I'll probably wait just a few more months. So wait six months. The reason why you want to varnish it, um, I usually just get a soft brush. They have varnishing brushes. You know, we have our um, like Windsor Newton kind of varnishing brushes and stuff. And you could get, um, we have Windsor Newton uh, high gloss varnish is what I use. And you just do a really thin coat. Do not pour your um, varnish on your painting. It's so cool on Instagram. I love them and I like them all the time, even though you're not supposed to but people will pour the varnish on the painting because it looks cool spreading out like glass. You want less varnish. So you want to dip your paintbrush in the varnish and get the thinnest amount of varnish you can. Let it dry thoroughly for a couple of days and then do a second layer if you if you feel like you want uh, even you know a little thicker layer of varnish, but don't paint a thick layer of varnish. Uh, I've done that and it just doesn't dry completely ever. You'll touch it and it'll kind of be tacky um so yeah if you're worried about varnishing though there's something I didn't varnish for years because my paintings would always go into shows right away within six months like it'd be the next week I have to turn it in uh but what you could do if that happens you could get our retouch varnish and that'll allow the paint to still breathe and it'll still be protected so the reason why you're varnishing is so that if you're like to clean your painting because dust got on it you're not touching the paint surface like I am now you'd just be touching varnish and all varnishes should be removable. So like if you do our uh, retouch varnish, you could always remove it and put a permanent varnish later. The permanent varnish is just gonna seal it a little bit better than the retouch varnish, but retouch varnish is better than nothing. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit on varnishing. Uh, also, if you're following us at the Fine Art Collective North America, we cover a lot of those techniques too. 
Uh, so that's TFACNA, T-F-A-C-N-A. -A. So it's the Fine Art Collective North America. I think they just recently, one of my colleagues just recently did a varnishing video, which you, you got to watch if you never varnish. I watched it because I was like, is there anything else I can learn? <laughs> you know, because uh, it's kind of scary. You're like, I don't know. I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to um, do it wrong. Uh, so I suggest doing on a little painting that you're, you don't really care about or uh, something, you know, old or something that you don't mind if you kind of like, uh, the only things that have gone wrong before is if I let it pool too much, you know, you have a thicker part or a, a brush stroke. It pretty pretty much levels out though. Um, if I'm doing small paintings, it's a lot easier. So just practice a little bit on, yeah, we don't, one you don't care about. You might see bubbles, but they kind of settle out um, within a few minutes. So don't worry too much about that. Another reason why to varnish too um, is your painting will get matte. So you'll notice that this uh, painting looks a lot deeper and richer and I'm using the same colors. It's just that the paint kind of what they call a sink, the pigment will kind of sink a little and it'll get more of a matte finish. So to bring it up and make it look like it was just painted yesterday, varnishing will do that. It'll bring out the colors again. Any other questions? I could, I don't know, if not, I'll go right into glazing. Uh, none have popped up yet. Okay, cool. I'm gonna let this thoroughly dry for six months to a year and then varnish it. Um, or I'll probably glaze on it. Uh, so for glazing, your layers are still gonna be kind of breathable. So you don't have to wait six months, but you do want it to be, you know, definitely dry to the touch. And uh, I will usually wait like two weeks or so before varnishing again. If, or not varnish, sorry, glazing in. The glaze is basically a thin layer um, on a painting. Actually, let me show you a painting that is finished with glazing so you get an idea. I always bring this one out in my demos because I know portraiture is something that's a little, um, a little intimidating sometimes color-wise. So this was painted using like a lot of monochromatic paints, paint scheme. So it was like, it was, it was pretty much very, um, it, it was hardly had any color. It was just like purples and like a pastel yellow. There was no rosiness, no pinks, nothing like that. No blues. All that was glazed in. So I didn't have to worry about color while I was painting form, if that makes sense. So I just painted the form of the face. Once I was pretty happy with the form of the face, then I let it thoroughly dry for a week or two. And then I used liquid and a transparent color. Like I actually used a little bit of our permanent rose and some of my cadmiums to start glazing in transparent colors over a uh, opaque background, over a really uh, kind of black and white background. And then the uh, lights that are in the background will flood through your transparent layer and give you an luminous kind of quality that you can't get from padding white. This butterfly, if if I try to get this blue, just adding white, it would dull down. So to get it, I painted it a lighter blue than I wanted. And then I glazed in some of my Windsor blue on top to bring out this blue that you can't mix. You can only get by layering a thin layer on top of something light. So hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> uh, Cause I'm gonna show you too though how it works. So I have this painting I did. Maybe you're like, oh, I finished my little painting with Ryan, uh, a Plaza Art Zoom call. And now I want to um, spend a couple weeks or a couple days and it's thoroughly dry. I want to, I don't know, I want to bring it out more. Maybe I didn't like how this background's showing up too much. So I'm going to create a vignette around it. So I'm going to reset my palette. Oh, maybe I won't because that's going to be a lot of work. I'm going to be painting, mixing my palette more down here. Uh, actually, I should have a handheld palette right here. Let's do that. I just don't want any white in my paint. So I'm going to use a new palette. And I'm going to get a little bit of my Windsor Blue. And then some of my magenta to kind of make a black. Not only that, but I want to try to bring out the oranges more. So I'm also going to put out a little yellow. And no white. 
I'm only using the light and white of my painting. You could glaze with white. You might, it just might end up being a little chalkier. Um, or I would suggest using something transparent like a zinc white. But I have my transparent colors. Uh, remember, this is semi-transparent. These two are transparent. It says on the back. It has like the little uh, code. So that's semi-transparent. And these ones are transparent. It has an empty square. I'm going to get a brush. Let me get a clean brush. <laughs> I prefer the softest brush you could find for glazing because it could kind of streak a little. I'm going to get some of my liquid and uh, let me do the orange first. So I want to up the orange a little. So I'm going to get a little bit of my magenta. I'm using much more liquid than I am pigment this time, more than paint. I'm going to use a lot of liquid. You could do this just with a more medium too. So I have like this orangey color and I could glaze let's say I want to glaze this darker, I could start painting on top of my layer to bring out the oranges more. Maybe I want all this darker too. I don't know if you could see, but it's starting to bring out the orange. The orange for me in person is singing a lot more than it was before. So I, I just very subtle. I'll be a little bit more bold, bolder than I would be usually because I want to show you on camera. So I could use a little more red and you can wipe it away, which is cool too. And now you're just kind of doing little like, almost like micro adjustments, which is why I love glazing. You could push your painting as far as you want. Could bring out some more darks. And now the reds and oranges are really coming out a lot more. I don't like one little part of this. I'll just scrub away. I always have Q-tips on hand. I could scrub away where I add a little too much. So you could add, you could take away a little, you could even paint into this again. Uh, so whenever someone's like, oh, I made a mistake, don't worry, you could glaze over it later. Uh, you could um, paint another little semi-transparent layer on top, adjust little things. Now I'm gonna do my um, background. I'm gonna paint a vignette real quick. So I'm gonna get my mostly blue. There is a little bit of the yellow and a little bit of magenta on my brush. So it kind of grayed down my blue a little. This is a lot of liquid and a little bit of paint. I could start bringing back some more darks. So I'm glazing on top transparent layers and you can see some of the plants showing through. They're just more subtle. I'm gonna darken the corner a lot so that it's kind of like, it's focusing more on the, the center of the painting. Maybe on the ground, I'm gonna add a lot more liquid because for glazing, you want it really thin. Maybe I want to darken this part so the bottom stands out a little more. So I'm just kind of glazing it in and darkening the whole background. So that's a fun trick with painting. It's one of my favorites because you can let this dry and then do an even another layer on top. Uh, it's pretty foolproof. I can make the but uh, the feathers, <laughs> the feathers, the wings, the fin. <laughs> I can make the fins look more transparent by painting some dark on top and glazing in that blue background right over top. I know it's so odd, but it just kind of almost feels like magic the way you could kind of make it look uh, even more ethereal after you already painted it in. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed so much. Glazing was my favorite part. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about brush care too. Uh, we have um, like a brush cleaner. You could use just a little bit of cold water to wash out your bristles. You don't want to hit this with too much with hot water because it could you know, loosen the glue and stuff. Uh, so just be kind of gentle with your brushes. Um, another thing was the, we talked about the varnishing already, which was awesome. Um, fat over lean, so always be adding less solvent to each layer if you are using solvent because you want uh, the solvent's going to make it more of a lean layer, more of a rigid layer. And if you do that on top, it could crack. Uh, but for liquid, I just use a little bit of liquid original in every layer, and that'll keep it um, pretty stable. So your paint won't be, um, you'll be stay uh, flexible in each layer, and you won't have to worry about like cracking or anything like that. I'll hand it over to you if you had any questions or if we wanted to do a gallery view. I'm so excited to see what people made. <laughs> I know it's my favorite part. Um, someone asked if liquid is considered a fat. 
It is. Uh, I actually just recently asked the chemist again because I'm pushing it a little more <laughs> in my paintings um, and it is considered a fat still. So you would want to make sure you're adding, uh, you would just add more of it to each layer. Like glazing is kind of an easy way to do it. You're just, you're having to add a lot of liquid anyways. Um, but the chemist pretty much said, just as long as you have some in every layer, you're making sure there's enough fat so that it's going to dry with a real steady film. So yeah, just make sure you're putting a little bit in every layer. Awesome. And then there's a question about spray varnish. Do you have, do you like it? Do you not? Do you I like tips? spray varnish for my large paintings um, because it's hard for me to kind of get an even layer with my, you know, paintbrushes. Even if they're this big, if you're doing like a six foot, eight foot painting, it's hard to varnish like that. So that's when I'll do spray varnish. I don't like using spray varnish as much uh, if I don't have to, like on small work, just because uh, you have to have a really well ventilated space. You don't want to be or a respirator as well too, that's um, a grade for that so that you don't have to breathe it in. So I would say spray varnish is great for, I think, large paintings, but for smaller, um, uh, the brush is just a lot easier to not have to ha like inhale any of the fumes. Excellent point. Um, and then for framing actually, so uh, Judith is asking what types of frame you use to, since you know for unfinished sides oh yeah um for framing i uh, usually my favorite places to go is you could just um i mean usually in contemporary art galleries we don't frame the work because the client is going to frame it but when like i have to do one recently um i usually you use like a floater frame because i like uh regular frames sometimes cut into your painting a little bit so if you have an unfinished painting i would suggest yeah like a regular frame so that it cuts in, but I usually finish the edges by painting it black or some neutral color, and then I'll have a floater frame so the paint goes, painting a seam. So the floater frame just kind of floats around the side. Um, and if you need any help, uh, I'm totally not a framer. So you should get like some consultation probably from like a framer at Plaza Art or something. Uh, for me, it's mostly painting that is where I could do the home run. But yeah, framing wise, I usually leave it up to the client or an expert. <laughs> Thanks. And we do have experts at our stores in the in the Plaza Framing Studio. So um, that's an excellent point. Okay. And it's interesting, this next question we addressed in our spring, um, you know, go gross green in your studio feature. So, uh, you know, how do you dispose of used solvent? Oh, yeah. Um, so my solvent, I mean, I do large work. I'll, I'm going to actually flip my camera so I can, you can see somebody. Hold on one second. Uh, while I'm talking to you. So for my paintings, I'll, you'll see like this big koi fish, right? Like I'm do, going through a lot of solvent. I still won't go through too much. Like I usually, in a year, I'll, I'll go through probably around this much solvent, two of these. Um, they usually get all the soot and everything in there. And then I'll take it to my dump. I actually have the disposable uh, place. I can dispose of it for pretty cheap. Um, Home Depot by me used to used to do it. Not in, I'm, The Home Depot near me now doesn't, but they used to, used to be able to pay them and uh, get rid of it. Um, a couple of things to keep in mind when you are painting with oil, like if you're new to oil painting, is if you did use, um, it's always good to use like a cotton shirts or something like that, something that's kind of, you could reuse, but just make sure it's uh, any of your uh, paint solvent or any oil paint that got on your paper towels or uh, materials, make sure it just dries flat. Wait for it to dry before you throw it away, because if it's crumpled up, it could get really warm and that's where you have to worry about like something combusting. Um, so just that, uh, yeah, make sure your pallets are dry, your materials are dry. And then I usually just put it in a metal tin until I take it, um, uh, my trash only like once a year, I'll go and yeah, dispose of it. So make sure you're not putting anything in the sink or anything like that. <laughs> awesome. All right, I think that is it. I think it's time for gallery view. <laughs> really excited. Thank you, Ryan. That was amazing. I really oh, appreciate good, yeah. it. Glad you liked it. Um, You're welcome. So I see the comments coming now. <laughs> yeah, no, amazing. Um, as always, such a pleasure to have you.